I see that it's six o'clock, so we are going to call this meeting to order of the Longmont Transportation Advisory Board meeting um, for Monday, January the 10th, 2022. And I want to take this time to welcome our new board member, Diane Christ, and uh, Council Member Yarborough. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Okay, um, now we're going to move to our roll call. Sandra Stewart. Present. Liz Osborne. I'm here. David McInerney. Present. Steve Lehner. Present. Diane Christ. Present. Council Member Yarbrough. Present. Okay. Um, is Joe Long not here? Okay, I thought maybe he was on the phone. Okay, um, we need to approve our minutes from the December 13th of 2021 meeting. And I need to have a motion to approve those minutes. Looks like Joe just hopped on, sorry to interrupt. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of suggested revisions. Okay, David, and what are they? Those now? Uh, Tyler, should we have the revisions now or should we uh, have a first and a second, um, prove the minutes in a second with additions? It should be a, a motion, a second discussion. Okay. okay. So I, I need to have a motion to approve the minutes in a second and then we'll have the discussion. Do you I want move, to move, Dave? Yeah, I move that we approve the minutes from the last, last meeting. And I I'll second, second that. Okay, if, uh, there is a motion to approve the minutes from uh, Steve Weiner and a second from um, Liz Osborne. Okay, now discussion. David. Yes, on uh, page two, number six, action items. Second paragraph, the third sentence reads in part, presented the Colorado 119 bikeway and greenway to the design. And that should read, presented the Colorado 119 bikeway and greenway design to the board. Thank you. And on page four, just a couple of spelling corrections to the bold text at the center of the page that is uh, summarizing a motion. The first correction would be adding a second E to my name. The second would be adding a second L to the word annually. And that's all I have. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, so it's been moved and, um, and seconded that we accept these minutes with the additions that David just gave us. All those in favor, raise their right hand or say aye, I guess. So we aye. Aye. Any opposed? Same sign? Okay, so it's been moved and approved. Okay, communication from staff, Tyler. Do you have any additional communications for us? No, no formal communications tonight, other than again, welcome council member Yarbrough and, and board member Chris to the, to the board. Um, don't want to put you on the spot too much, but if there's anything you'd like to say, um, what interests you in, TA, in transportation um, or just a, a simple hi, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, either way, well, welcome both of you to the board. Good, good group we have here, so appreciate the opportunity. Well, thanks for having us, Tyler. Um, I'm excited to get going on this. I'm very interested in transportation. Um, I, I ran for city council um, in the last election, and I'm very interested in the Hyperloop, which is a, a statewide transportation initiative, but it will also drive a lot of local transportation issues. And I rode the bus to Boulder for many years. I'm a bicycle rider. I I just see a lot of need for transportation within the city. So I'm excited to be on the board. Thanks. Thank you. 
Yes, yeah, so one of the reasons, thanks Diana, thanks for um, applying for the board and um, so good to see you again. Um, one of the reasons why I applied to be a part of the transportation board is so that I can learn more and being newly to a new city council person, um, I think I can never learn everything, but what is important to me definitely is transportation as well and how, um, what does that look like? What does that mean? I mean, that so many, um, you know, uh, community members can look about and complain and not understand the groundwork and the operation of it and decision making and things like that. So being a single mom with kids in and out of school in St. Brain and in Boulder County, there were some challenges as a single parent and it was really hard and things that I really didn't understand. Um, and a lot of times I don't get that within city council, going to attending city council meetings or watching city council meetings. So I felt like it was important for me before I could point a finger to anyone is to get on these boards and to learn and understand. Um, and so I can ask you all the experts about it and things like that, right? And also the city and ask them, why do we not have public transportation to go out to Altona Middle School, right? Why do we not have pub public transportation that goes out to NIWI? Why do we not have public transportation to go out to UC Health Hospital where a lot of our, you know, uh, residents work out there and then they have to get Uber or things like that. So um, it's not to point fingers. It's just, I just need a clear understanding and learn so that I can also talk to my constituents when they come and ask me about it, uh, which are really good, valid questions. And so, and there's just so much more to learn, right? So much more to learn about transportation. Um, so I'm just grateful to have this opportunity to be on this board and to know you all and um, to get to learn. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. We are ready now, I think Tyler, for um, public invited to be heard. Yes, and it looks like, as far as I can tell from the list, it looks like we have one, one call in, unless it's someone else that's on this call. It looks like there's just one for right now. And I am correct that I need to ask them to state their name and their address. Yes. And then um, tell us what their yeah. concern was. Okay. All yep. right. We're ready. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, welcome to the Transportation Advisory Board meeting. Um, could you tell us your name and your address? Uh, name is Scott Stewart, 229 Grant Street. Okay, Scott, um, please tell us your concern. Um, there's been a lot of uh, chatter on uh, next door about the parking situation around the West side tavern, which is, uh. Between grant and Sherman street on 3rd Avenue. Um, some parking restrictions have been, um, or parking signs have been implemented. Uh, I believe for the purpose of uh, educating people and for uh, as far as um, setback distances from sidewalks or from uh, intersections and driveways, as well as line of sight issues. Um, I think this is entirely appropriate for given the area and the amount of traffic that goes through 3rd Avenue. Um, there is a conflict with the business in that uh, it is eliminating uh, parking in front of the business. Um, and with the signage, this will uh, push the restaurant parking into the neighborhoods, into the uh, adjacent streets. Um, I live in the adjacent streets. This is extremely unfortunate, um, but I believe that the safety measures that are uh, being put in place are appropriate. Um, I think there's a longer conversation to be had as far as the um, tavern not providing parking for their customers and using uh, the side streets for parking. But uh, I believe um, if this issue comes up and I anticipated more people on the call um, that safety first and um, if you guys are looking at this, please look at uh, the line of sight coming from 
Grant Street, uh, 200 block of Grant Street out to 3rd Avenue, there are uh, definitely issues when um, cars are parked uh, between the tavern and um, Grant Street. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the meeting. Yep. It does look like we have another caller. Okay. Hello? Hello. Hi, is that me? Yes, could you tell us your name and your address, please? Sure, my name is John Lochran. I live at 220 Sherman, sort of behind Scott. Uh, I also am calling in reference to the parking at up along 3rd. And I just wanted to say thank you to the board and the folks who were responsible for put, doing the traffic study. Um, I had three things I wanted to touch upon. One was my wife came home from work twice last week. Very excited that she could driving down Francis, so she's driving south on Francis. She was able to make a left on third and then down to Sherman. Previously, for the longest time, she had been going around the block. So she had been coming down Francis, making a right on third, driving another block west, and then going left on or south on Francis and around the block. To our house just to avoid that whole scenario up there and the lack of visibility coming from Francis. So she was very excited, and I thank you for that. Uh, I had spoken to Tyler previously. I just wanted to see about the some of the data or decision making that goes into the survey because there's a lot of discussion about it. But I don't know that people really understand. Like, what are we? What are the guidelines? In order to uh, like, what do you need for a visibility line, or what's you know, how does that correspond with the traffic flow? And I, I think that would be uh, the public would be helped by uh, having some information on that to uh, provide some logic or some you know some grounded discussion a bit. And uh, finally, the last point, my initial complaint that the coffee with council were based on people. Uh, Illegally parking on the corners and over uh, parking over, you know, the crosswalks. They're not following the setbacks of 20 feet from the crosswalk or from the fire hydrant or whatever. But, um, you know, like that still goes on. And, and there have been complaints to the police department over the years. And I've never, I've spoken to police officers, but there's never been a citation that I'm aware of. And now, you know, there's kind of a protest. People are parking along the street there in defiance of the signs, but they're still parking in over the crosswalks. So, you know, it's, you know, it depends. You know, there's fewer cars there now, but, you know, I don't know if that's part of the protest or just people don't know, like, hey, it's 20 feet setback, even though there's a sign there. Or I, I don't know what the issue is on that, but, you know, to coordinate with the police department would be awesome. And I think that would help, uh, you know, create a safer environment for everybody. So that's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, John. Thank you for your interest. Okay. Your concern. Yeah. Tyler, is there anybody else? I'm not seeing any others. If there's if there's anyone I'm missing, please please speak up. Yes. Could you state your name and your address, please? I can't hear her. I can't either. Should we ask her to call back? I think that would be appropriate. If you were trying to call and, and speak, please, please call back in and we'll Accommodate the comment. That seem reasonable. David Stuckman is from has a mic on. Oh. Chair Stewart, maybe the thing to do would be um if we, if we get any other callers calling back in, the board could make a motion to add a final call, public invited to be heard at the end of the meeting. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's what we'll do. I does will somebody make a motion that if if we have another caller while the meeting progresses that we can um have a, a time at the end of the meeting for public to be heard. Somebody like okay. I'd be happy yes. to make that motion that if someone else calls in, we will make time at the end of the meeting for the person to be heard or persons. And is there a second for that, please? I'll second. Yeah. Oh, Diane. Okay, thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, great. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, Tyler, I think we're moving on to, um, or do we need to discuss what we just heard? No, okay. Um, yeah. Action items um, you're, you're bringing to us uh, the 2022 tab work plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Chair Stewart and, and board members, I've and introduce myself before Tyler Stamey, I'm the city's transportation engineering administrator and the liaison to this board. So, and for, for those that I haven't met, nice, nice to meet you all. And for everyone else, great to see you um, on our monthly call here. Um, tonight before you, we talked last month about the proposed work plan. We, we discussed it briefly and sent this information out at the last meeting and asked for if you have any comments, feedback. In the meantime, please provide that and we can see what we can do to work it in the work plan. And then at this meeting, we're asking the board to, to take action to recommend the work plan. Um, I did receive comments, um, Chair Stewart, from you about the flex ride and getting the flex staff in here to provide a discussion on their service. And I think what we'll try to do, I do have it on there on the work plan. I think we'll try to coordinate that as close as we can with RTD and getting RTD in, but there's a chance they don't line up. But we will, we will still bring that information or do what we can to bring that information to the board in quarter two. And then board member McInerney, you had talked about some ideas for traffic safety fund that you had sent to me. And I think maybe it would be good discussion to have with the board with, with those comments. Um, if, if you want to talk about that, but otherwise, um, leave it, leave it to the board to discuss the proposed work plan. We are looking for motion. And then action on this one. Okay. Um, do does somebody want to make a, a motion to accept this, and then we'll have a second, and then we'll have a discussion about it. Or do you have any questions to ask Tyler about it? I think the only other thing I would say about this is, um, you know, we, we do our best to follow this, this work plan, but there are things that come up through the year that we need to add to the agenda, or maybe some things on here, on here that we don't get to. Just throwing that out there for discussion. It's a work plan. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Liz, were you going to. Yes, I was going to move that we accept the proposed work plan and schedule for 2022. Second it. It's been moved and seconded, moved by Liz Osborne and um, seconded by David McEnany um, to approve this um, work plan, 2020 work plan for TAB. Um, is there any discussion? Yes, David. Uh, I was looking at the traffic safety fund line item in the work plan. And well, we discussed that um, at our last meeting. Mm -hmm. And since there is a substantial uh, surplus in that fund, my suggestion is to devote some staff resources to identifying potential pedestrian and bicyclist safety measures that are not yet being implemented in Longmont in order to um, improve traffic safety. And I thought that might involve a literature search. It might involve um, Longmont staff contacting their counterparts in some of the communities that seem to be doing better in terms of traffic fatalities 
than Longmont is, or it might involve, uh, you know, funding um, staff attendance at a conference that's focused on traffic safety. My idea is just to get some new ideas to present to council and to tab on how to uh, keep improving our traffic safety. I have a, I have a quick question. <clears throat> yes, Steve. Um, Tyler, um, weren't, were those funds going towards um, a coordinator that was doing um, events and activities throughout the city currently? Board Member Laner, yes. Th right now, that some of the, some of that fund goes to fund a part-time staff member, and then primarily the the rest of what it's used for is some training classes, bike helmets, bike lights. Um, I think Phil talked about that a bunch at the last one, but yes, it does partially fund a, a part-time staff member. Okay, so I guess my question is the amount that we have on the report is the total amount from the safety fund, and then a portion of that is already being used for the coordination or the coordinator position, as well as the additional equipment that's needed for those events. Is that correct? I, I believe that's true, but I need to um, pull out the report that we had last month to, to verify that one. So then Tyler, is it correct to say that the $23,000 surplus hasn't been allocated yet to any use? If I can get an answer on that here real quick. Looks like my, my my reading of this column from last month is that at the end of 2020, um, fund balance was 23,000. So it will continue to accrue through 2021, 2022. Um, we didn't have the 2021 numbers at the last meeting. Um, the salary for that staff member comes out of this. It's a running total as is. The 23 is not necessarily a surplus. The, Salary is then subtracted throughout the year from that. So there isn't a $23,000 surplus as far as you can tell. That, that's a fund balance, not necessarily a surplus. Got it. Liz. Chairman, um, returning to approving, discussing the work plan. Would I be correct in understanding that this kind of concern and conversation could come up as needed under point three of the capital improvement program, bicycle and pedestrian? We can continue to discuss this throughout the year. Makes sense to me. Is I guess I'm just <laughs> I'm wanting to make sure that this is an important thing, sure. but it's kind of sidetracking from the idea of is this the plan we're going to have? And it, I think it does fit in. We can ad address it as we want to going forward. Does that make sense? Sure. Yes. And David, does that work for you? Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council member Yarborough. Yes. So I just have a question. Um, is there any education that is already being done within the community as far as, and is it with the cyclist or is it general education, even with um, our drivers as well? Lauren does education, doesn't she, Tyler? She does, and um, 
Ben, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Is this one that you have some information on that you could share with some of that program? Sure, I can. So, yes, uh, Lauren Greenfield is the traffic safety coordinator for the city of Longmont. <clears throat> Her primary focus is on bicycles and pedestrian safety. Um, she last year, I believe she was working on some videos um, for both bicycle and pedestrian safety. Um, <clears throat> also, out of our the city's risk department, they routinely put out um, information uh, that goes out to to the entire city on the city's newsletter um, on items uh, regarding safety. That does include uh, things like driver safety. Uh, so the, the answer, the short answer is, is yes. And, and then, of course, we also have a newsletter called LOCO about cycling, which is stands for Longmont, Colorado, about cycling. And uh, one of the things we offer every month is uh, a rules of the road. And it doesn't necessarily pertain to bicycling per se but uh, pertains to bicycling and walking as well as um, those aspects of, of chapter 11 of the municipal code, uh, which is the, the traffic code um, pertaining to, to, to drivers and, and operation of motor vehicles for as how, as how it affects um, bicycling and, and walking. So, so yes, we, we, we have a number of avenues that we're pursuing. Okay. Well, I was just listening to David and I mean, really good points and everything. And I'm pretty, I, I mean, I know you all have some type of safety measures um, implemented within the city and, and all of that. I just didn't know to what extent, like, are you providing some type of education to the cyclist shops? Like we have a cyclist shop on Main Street when people purchase their bikes. Um, are there, is there any information at the DMV when people, when we have 15, 16 year olds, are they receiving any information about what to look for? Um, I mean, when during my campaign, I remember, I can't not remember this lady's name, but she was awesome. I learned so much just from her with the police officers. Use your right arm to open the door so you can look back and things like that. I had never been taught. Um, just things like that is very, very uh, effective. Um, so I was just wondering, how are we educating our community members? That's that was that was the only thing I knew. I knew we were, but I was just wondering, are we reaching out to the bike bicycles, the cyclist shops? Um, are we actually in the high schools? You know what I'm saying? Are we giving those newsletters to those high school students? Um, are we? You know, I mean, I know the police department is also partnering as well. So I was just wondering, because I know my daughter never received anything, so she never told me about it, and she, she loves to cycle. Unfortunately, I'm not a cyclist because it's been so long since I've been on a bike, but hopefully I will be on a bike soon. But um, so I'm just kind of figuring out how we can get this communication, uh, you know, across um, our community. And that's very important um, from, you know, drivers and cyclists and pedestrians, right? So I was just trying to get a little bit more information that way. Thank you. Yes, Diane. Uh, actually, I think Liz was first. If you'd like oh. to go first, Liz. 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 Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, what I'm hearing a consistent thing from all these comments is we might want to have a point on our work plan that is about outreach. Um, whether it was about the West Side Tavern or about bicycle safety or on next door, I have seen the constant conversation of how do we get the city to be more transparent? I know the city is extremely transparent at the website, but apparently we're not. Re and they're also great when we have stuff like downtown and do the art walk and stuff and there's things there, but we might want to consider whether we could get rolling a way to find out where do people get their information and how can we get that information to them? Good point. Thank you. Diane. Well, these are all great ideas. Um, David, I'm interested to hear um, what specifically you have in mind in terms of safety programs. I was concerned when I <clears throat> participated in the board once before about uh, a statistic 
for pedestrians and bicyclists that 50% of the accidents and, and fatalities for the pedestrian or bicyclist. And I actually, I'm a, a regular bicyclist and I was riding on 21st, I was going west and stopped at Gay Street and there, there was a double stop there. You stop to cross the one part of 21st and then you stop before the second part. And I saw the gentleman stop and started out into the street, but I keep an eye on the automobiles around me and he plowed through and then looked at me like, what are you doing in the middle of the intersection? So uh, if the bicyclist doesn't pay attention, as Shakita pointed out, uh, there can be a pretty severe accident. And I did have training as a teenager and um, when I was growing up. So that is something that would be helpful, I think, to bicyclists, but also to the motorists, because sometimes they're looking around, they don't always look in the, in the crosswalks is what I think is missing. Thank you. Steve. Yeah, <clears throat> I guess as a, one of the, another cyclist, I, I actually worked in bicycle retail um, quite a number of years ago and have done bike rodeos and um, the general rules of thumb with the educational side of it that that I found is, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, elementary and junior high children are the ones that you really want to start with the you know bike rodeos, safety programs, and that sort of thing. And then you branch, branch up to your bike shops and your bike clubs. Sadly, and, and I think everybody can agree that we see this more and more, drivers are less likely to gain new skills. Mm -hmm. So we have to start with the cyclists, the folks who are most vulnerable, pedestrians and all that. So that's why we always drill into high vis clothing at night, you know, lights and that sort of a thing. Um, but I completely agree with the idea of outreach. Um, you know, the, the, the Dutch did that whole campaign of reaching across when you open up your door with your other arm forces you mm -hmm. to look behind. Mm -hmm. And that actually eliminated door accidents, cyclists and doors by a dramatic number, I think it was over 70% in that country alone. Now you can imagine trying to, again, educate car, you know, motorists to that is gonna be a much more expensive campaign than we probably have a budget for. So I, I think starting small at the educational level and figuring out what are our best shots to, to uh, you know, get this information out is probably our best chance at this. Uh, and the older we get, I'm just saying, and this is from somebody obviously on social media and seeing Twitter, and I'm part of you know a lot of cycling groups. You're going to have less likely to help from the motorist side than you will from getting cyclists to engage and or be a, be a part of this. Just, just saying, I'm not trying to pass a judgment on on anything or anybody in regards to that. So, just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, wonderful conversation here. Wonderful discussion on bike safety and and um, transparency and education. We need we need to do better. Um, I don't know how we're going to go about that, but we need to pass or we need to approve the action item for our 2022 work plan, and then maybe Tyler, this could be brought into another time that we can have more discussion on this and figure out a plan? Or Stewart, you all Chair. figure out a plan and you bring it to us. Yeah, Chair, Chair Stewart, I think what I'm hearing and, and what I would propose would be adding to the work plan a another line under the other in terms of outreach. And, and potentially we talk about outreach and safety education options. And I'm sure we'd have enough content to, to fill an entire meeting and more with that one item talk about how um, and, and brainstorming here and don't have a full vision of what it looks like, but potentially bring in our public outreach team, provide some perspective on efforts that they're doing and how we can improve those. Um, some of the other staff perspectives, I, I think our, you know, our planning group and Aaron's on this call, you'll hear from here later. She facilitates a lot of public meetings that, that can be um, She's a great facilitator and, and does a good job of navigating some of the more contentious meetings. So I think maybe maybe hearing some of all of that together at one meeting and bring it together into something that we can do and change would be a good a good topic for a meeting. So happy to add that to the work plan. Great. Thank you. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we um, approve the 22 
2022 proposed tab work plan and schedule. Okay, all those in favor, raise your right hand and say I, 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 I. Okay, all those opposed. Okay, I just want to I just want to make sure that we add that line item. Otherwise, I agree. Okay. Added under other as a line item. Okay. All right. Okay. It's passed. Can, Thank you. Can I, yes, go ahead. Clarification that that was a unanimous vote with the extra item added. Yes. All right. Okay, so next we have our information items. Um, the St. Brain Greenway status update. Josh Sherman, our senior civil engineer, I think he's here. So I think we're ready to hear from Josh. And welcome. Josh, Josh, well, welcome and thanks for being willing to share, share your Monday night with, with us and talk about St. Brain. Josh has been working on this for long time couple years and has done a lot of great work on this project. So Josh, I'll let you share all your successes and from there. Thank you everyone. Let me um, work on sharing my screen and getting um, a slideshow pulled up just briefly. Okay, I should be sharing um, <clears throat> my screen and you should hopefully be able to see um, on your screens uh, the cover slide here. Is that true? Yes. Be... Wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Josh Sherman. I am a senior civil engineer in the city's public works and natural resources department. I'm one of the project managers who have been working on the city's resilient same brain project. A um, few things to talk about today or, um, you know, summary of the project goals. The scope of work, um, a schedule of the work that's been completed and a schedule of some upcoming work. A little bit about the cost of the project and some of the benefits moving forward. <clears throat> Uh, project goals for the Resilient St. Brain project, or sometimes referred to as RSVP, are to fully restore the St. Brain Greenway Trail, improve the St. Brain Creek Channel to protect people, property, and uh, infrastructure from future flood risks, and then to complete the work in an environmentally sensitive way. I like to think about RSVP as a master plan for St. Brain Creek uh, through the city of Longmont. And this work, um, although it began, the city began looking at the floodplain on St. Brain Creek and, and planning for projects before the 2013 flood, uh, this work really began in earnest following, um, following that event in 2013. <clears throat> this slide, is, have I moved off the? Uh, no. Thank you, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, there, there we, we go. Moved. There were the project goals that I just went over uh, and some slides of some pictures showing uh, the 2013 flood event. Next slide. house. <laughs> there was my house. Your house is in this slide? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so this slide shows geographically the uh, extent of the project. You can see the city limits of Longmont sort of in the tan color with St. Brain Creek moving uh, from through the center of the slide there. The project was uh, broken into several phases. Um, the Sandstone Ranch Reach, which you see out to the right side of the slide, um, east of town, beginning at uh, Boulder Creek and then working upstream to County Line Road, uh, was the work to restore um, St. Brain Channel through uh, the city's open space out of the Sandstone District Park. Um, there's a gap reach sort of between sandstone and the city reach um, for connectivity and, and for floodplain analysis. We certainly evaluated that section. However, there were no project improvements included in the master plan uh, within what we referred to as the gap reach there. <clears throat> and then finally, um, 
the city reach, which is the section of uh, St. Brain Creek through the developed portion of town, really from the confluence with Left Hand Creek uh, out west to Airport Road at the extent of the city's planning area. <clears throat> this next slide um, zooms in on uh, the city reach itself, which is the majority of, of the work to be completed on the project. This slide illustrates um, the phases. This project was broken into phases based on uh, funding availability um, and for other reasons. And so the work really be on a project like this had to begin on the downstream end and then work upstream as we increase the channel capacity um, to carry additional flows. And so what you see on this slide beginning on the right is the city reach in yellow, which is uh, complete. That's the area that includes the Dickens Farm Nature area. Um, this slide also shows uh, work that's been completed to replace several crossings over St. Brain Creek. So Main Street Bridge and South Pratt Parkway Bridge are complete. <clears throat> the area in red is what we refer to as City Reach 2A, and the area in green we refer to as City Reach 2B, which are both completed sections. Um, City Reach 2B included replacement of the BNSF railroad crossing as well as replacement of the uh, pedestrian bridge at Price Road. <clears throat> that work was completed uh, in 2021. And then work ongoing is this section here in, in blue, which is referred to as the Isaac Walton Reach 1, uh, sort of from Price Road upstream to Boston. That work is um, actually taking shape right now, and, and um, a lot of the hardscape infrastructure is complete and um, just some landscaping and revegetation remaining on that on that project. Um, <clears throat> work upcoming is replacement of the Boston Avenue Bridge, as well as work on, on this section, which we refer to as Isaac Walton Reach 2, which I'll talk more about in a little bit, um, where the city's partnering with the Army Corps of Engineers on the design and construction of that phase. Uh, Sunset Street Bridge was replaced by Boulder County a couple of years after the flood. And so that structure is uh, new. And then really uh, moving west of Sunset, which is we refer to as City Reach 3, and uh, the first phase of that being Hover Road Reach, is work that is unfunded. So we do have a master plan with some conceptual level design alternatives in place, um, but, but that work is currently not funded. I have a short video that I'm going to try to play, so I'm going to get out of um, <clears throat> my slideshow presentation. I was uh, preparing this slideshow presentation and realized that this video is now about a year and a half old and um, maybe worth doing another aerial flight to improvements on St. Brain Creek. Here we go.
Okay, let me find my mouse and I will. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> So, clearly I put together uh, that presentation for a council meeting back in August of 2020. And um, I like the very end of the, of the video where you can see the work going on, but there's been, uh, that work's complete now and a lot of vegetation is filled in. So we'll have to try to update that video. Okay, so back to the presentation. It should be back on the screen again. Yes. Okay. So, as I'd mentioned, um, some of the work that's been completed, uh, the city reaches 1, 2A, and 2B, including replacement of several bridges over St. Brain Creek. Um, some of the accolades for the project, uh, project received a 2018 APWA award for uh, sustainability for large communities, and also an APWA Colorado chapter award uh, for parks and trails, um, and that project was uh, for the Dickens Farm Nature Area. And then uh, we've completed, we have completed, um, as we complete improvements on the creek, we are uh, working on completing floodplain remapping, which is one of the goals of the project to um, uh, mitigate the floodplain um, through, sit through the city. And so we've submitted on a letter of map revision for work uh, up to City Reach 2A. And then we are initiating a second letter of map revision for the recently completed work of replacement of the railroad bridge and um, the channel improvements associated with that phase. That will help to uh, start to, to mitigate some of the flooding in the lower downtown area as, uh, um, as we increase the capacity in the channel. <clears throat> Isaac Walton Reach 1 is the section that I said that was under construction. Again, it's scheduled to be completed uh, in the spring of this year, um, as we can get a chance to complete uh, landscaping and revegetation, um, that that was uh, a section that was retaining walls um, and adjacent to the St. Ray Mobile Home Park, and sort of located behind the um, left-hand brewing tasting room, if uh, you know, for for landmark. Uh, again, the next phase going upstream is. The work that we're doing with the Army Corps of Engineers through a public partnership agreement. <clears throat> um, that work is from Boston Avenue up to sunset and includes the Boston Avenue bridge replacement. And so the city is leading the effort for the design of the Boston Avenue bridge replacement and the Army Corps of Engineers are leading the design effort for the channel improvements starting from upstream of the bridge to sunset, which includes reconstruction of a levee between Isaac Walton Pond and St. Brain Creek, which helps protect um, the split flows that we saw during 2013, where the Isaac Walton Pond breached on the east side and, um, and, and, and flooded down through uh, First Avenue and the railroad tracks. So a little more information on phase two um, and that partnership with the Army Corps, that's uh, approximately a $15 million project and uh, we're cost sharing with the Army Corps <clears throat> through that public partnership agreement. The city's funding match comes from several sources, one of those being just local funds match that are required for design. The Army Corps gives credit to the city for land ownership and acquisition. So the value of the property that the improvements are being made on are considered um, a part of the match. And then work in kind, and in this case, the work in kind would be the Boston Avenue bridge replacement, which is a significant portion of the city's match. And in fact, um, a minimum would be a 35% local agency match. So on the city side, and we are uh, matching up to 49% in this particular agreement because of the cost of that um, Boston Avenue bridge replacement. <clears throat> and then uh, the, the schedule for this work is that Boston Avenue Bridge uh, replacement is um, has in final design. The final design is actually complete, and we're looking at going out to bid um, actually here in the next month or so on that project. So that project should be under construction um, 
really in the second quarter of this year. The Army Corps is in um, working on 65% design for the channel improvements uh, through their section, and, and they are due to submit that design for review at the end of this month. That would put them towards 95% uh, design for the spring of this year, and then they um, would like to be out to bid on their section uh, later this summer and starting construction late this summer, early fall of this year for the channel improvements. So as we complete one phase of the project, um, sort of dovetail into starting the next, the next phase of work. <clears throat> uh, this uh, map shows um, some of the floodplain improvements, tries to illustrate some of the floodplain improvements that are being completed for the project. So <clears throat> the area in magenta is, is, you know, sort of the main stem of St. Brain Creek. Uh, the area in blue is, is the 100 year floodplain. Um, and then what you see is the hatched area is the area that's being removed from the floodplain as a part of the project. Now, the, the bulk of the area north of St. Brain Creek will not be completely removed from the floodplain until the project is complete up to sunset. And that levee is constructed between Isaac Walton Pond and St. Brain Creek. But this slide really does illustrate um, the, the, the improvements and, and the uh, benefits of those improvements for the channel uh, work that's being completed. Then. What, what you see to the west here is uh, additional floodplain that'll be captured and, and mitigated um, when improvements are completed west of sunset. And I have some slides upcoming that sort of illustrate that. <clears throat> so again, City Reach 3 is from um, Sunset Street going west to Airport Road. And we, we would anticipate that work being completed in phases, similar to how the downstream project has been completed. And the first phase or reach that we are, are considering is the Hover Road reach. So it would be improvements from Sunset Street upstream to Hover, Hover Road or Hover Street, including a new crossing, a new bridge at Hover. Um, the goal of this project is to capture out of bank flooding that's occurring upstream of Hover and coming out of the South Bank or the River Right and uh, flooding over Hover Street and then into Fairgrounds Pond. And the preferred design alternative is to create a split flow channel through Fairgrounds Pond to capture that overbank flooding and then return that, uh, that those flows back into the main stem of St. Brain Creek. <clears throat> uh, this work is about a $20 million project to get from Sunset to Hover, including an, uh, a new crossing at Hover Street. Um, and, and the city's actively looking for grant funding um, to be able to, to complete that work. And the benefits would be that this area that you see south of St. Brain Creek down to the railroad crossing in Price Road is, is the 100 year floodplain. And the area, it, it, the area that's in sort of this salmon color would be the area that's removed from that floodplain with these project improvements being completed. Um, <clears throat> so, what does is, what is RSVP cost? Um, the estimated total cost for the project is around $140 million. This slide illustrates the work that's been completed and or funded are the line items that you see in green. So, design and permitting, uh, the reaches that I've discussed, the Sandstone Ranch reach, the city reach up through 2B. Isaac Walton Reach 1 channel and Isaac Walton Reach 2, which includes uh, the replacement of the Boston Avenue Bridge. <clears throat> City Reach 3, which I have shown here in red, is, is representing unfunded work. And uh, as I mentioned, the first phase, the Hover Road Reach, would represent about $20 million of that $60 million that's unfunded <clears throat> to, to total up again to the $140 million, which doesn't include the work that's been completed on the bridge crossings, which were funded out of, um, out of the street fund or the transportation. <clears throat> so how do we pay for all these project improvements? Um, funding came from several sources. Uh, one of them was a $20 million voter approved storm drainage bond following 2013 flood. Um, we also utilize FEMA disaster recovery, uh, public, 
public assistance alternative procedure. So a PAP project, um, housing and urban development, community development block grant. So CDBG, DR, disaster relief. Both of those were a result of funding that was available following the 2013 flood. Um, we, we received some additional HUD funding through the governor's signature project and utilized that um, on the City Reach 2B flood recovery project. I mentioned uh, the phase that we're working on with the Army Corps of Engineers through their 205 program and the funding that they're partnering on with the city for that work. And then finally, on the bottom right there is uh, some additional grant opportunities in the uh, FEMA BRIC program, their Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities program, uh, where we are actively trying to submit for grants to um, help fund the the Hover Road Reach. Um, last year, City Council did approve rate increases to the Storm Drainage Fund, and those rate increases uh, will also um, can also be utilized and help fund uh, some of this this unfunded work, specifically the Hover Road Reach. So that was my overview of uh, the Resilient Saint Brain and sort of the status of the project and where we are today and where we're going. And uh, I'm happy to accept any questions. Does anyone have any questions of Josh? Yes, Liz. Thank you, Josh. Um, I know there's a lot of development being proposed for along the Hover Reach. Can you reassure us that the that um, housing development or retail development? is going to be in at least parallel or be thought about during the design of the RSVP things? Um, well, I'm not sure specifically which development you're referring to, but the, the project improvements for that Hoover Road reach are primarily on um, city owned property through the Rogers Grove nature area and then um, where you see the crossing at Hover Road, um, that there is some property that was annexed a few years ago, um, and and in that annexation agreement, considered, um, you know, the improvements needed for RSVP, i.e., um, any acquisition that might be needed for land west of Hover Road for the channel improvements. Um, that helps answer the question. It does. Um, I guess I was thinking about that former cement plant right there. Just oh. that that there's been a lot of talk about what will happen with that. And I'm thinking I want to be reassured that that's being considered in parallel because you're going to have development and traffic at the same time that all this other stuff is trying to be taken care of. Absolutely. Um, as we move west through town, um, you know, we've talked about it. Every, Internally, with regard to the Boston Avenue bridge replacement, you know, that project is anticipated to be replaced in phases. Um, so we would, you know, shift traffic to 1 side of the bridge while we demo that structure to replace it. Similar to how main street and South Parkway were replaced. Um, and that would allow for that industrial area to continue to use Boston as a truck route. Um, in, in, the, in the west east and west direction, but specifically west out to Hover. Um, as opposed to, let's say, an alternative where um, Sunset Street Bridge was replaced while the entire road was closed, which occurred, you know, the road was closed after the flood anyways, but that that project was constructed differently because it wasn't constructed in phases. But the consideration for the replacement of Boston would be in phases. Are there any other questions of Josh? Or Josh, I see a hand. You do. Okay, I don't see any hands, but whoever it's, has their hand up, <laughs> it's David. I uh, okay. just wanted to thank Josh for a very informative presentation, and confirm that once all the phases are complete, there will be a continuous multi-use path. Yes. Uh, when all right. the work is complete, the St. Vrain Greenway will be whole again. <laughs> Good. It has been closed. Long time. Um, progress upstream. We, you know, sort of open 
the section has been completed, but then we're, you know, rolling a closure upstream um, adjacent to whatever work might be ongoing. And so ultimately and eventually once uh, the St. Brain Creek improvement project are completed, uh, the Greenway Trail would be, you know, accessible again all the way from Golden Ponds all the way out east to, to Sandstone Ranch. Great. Thank you. Any other questions of Josh? Thank you, Josh. That was that was most informative. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Stop sharing here, Tyler, and I'll return the presentation back over the meeting. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, our next item is a uh, sugar mill and steam project update. Erin Fostick is going to be presenting for us with the city. She's the principal planner, I think. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Uh, TAB board members. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Um, nice to see some of you again and nice to see some of you for the 1st time as, um. Chair Stewart just mentioned, I'm a principal planner with the city's planning division. And tonight, what I wanted to do is just provide a brief overview of the sugar mill and steam sub area plan. Uh, I did provide a communication with a link to a video. We presented something similar to city council um, last month and um, have some additional maps that uh, relate to transportation that you all will be interested in that we didn't share with council. But really tonight is just information sharing. And certainly if you have some high level um, ideas or concepts that you want to share. I'd love to hear those and then obviously any questions that you have. So, with that, I will go ahead and share my screen and this is a different program than I typically use. So, bear with me if I. Share the wrong screen, can you guys all see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and I also just want to give credit. We are working with a consultant team that's led by Stantec. Um, they're a, an international planning firm, planning and design. And so this uh, presentation was originally put together by them, which is why you see their logo. I do not obviously work for Stantec. Um, so just to get us started, I'm sure some of you have heard of this, um, but for others, just to ground you, last year, late last year, we um, planning and redevelopment partnered with Stantec to produce a detailed sub area plan for what we're calling the sugar mill and steam areas. It's sort of a mouthful, but I'll be honest with you, we couldn't come up with a better, more descriptive project name. So that's where we landed. Um, and the reason that it's sugar mill and steam is because essentially there's two project areas. And for those of you who had a chance to listen to the council discussion and certainly um, council member Yarbrough was participating in that, I, I believe you were there. Um, these are really two distinct areas, but what we're working to do is really think about how can we knit them together? And I, and I mentioned this because this is, is a real opportunity from a connectivity perspective, first and foremost, but I do want to make mention that um, the plan we're developing isn't going to be proposing a one size fits all solution for this 250 acre sub area. So we know that there's different opportunities and challenges within different parts of the, of the sub area. Frankly, even within different parts of the steam area and different parts of the sugar mill area, and we can get into those if you'd like. As such, there's going to be different opportunities for um, urban design treatments, how we think about character in each of these areas, how we integrate them through our multimodal network. Um, and, and so we'll be looking at all that. The other thing that this study is helping us do is take a look at phasing. You know, this is a pretty large area. We've seen an increase in development interest. Um, obviously, I think you just mentioned um, during the last item, there's growth being proposed throughout Longmont in this area is no exception. Um, Josh just mentioned that some areas um, near downtown will be removed from the floodplain with some of the resilient St. Brain project and portions of the steam area are included in that. Um, and so we really need to think about what makes sense from a phasing perspective um, and what makes sense for public and private investments in infrastructure. And so this plan will help us look at all that and create a um, essentially a framework that we can work with the community and work with the development community and property owners on. 
We've developed some high level goals for the project. And if you go to our Engage Longmont site, we have these up there and we're interested in hearing from the community on, as we think about these high level goals, what is most important? So obviously we know that housing is incredibly important to our community. And so how can we think about diverse housing options at appropriate locations in this study area? Um, and that would be a wide range of types, different types of ownership, different types of price points. And so we're thinking about all of those things. Obviously, transportation is huge. I've mentioned that a few times, and I know you all are interested in that. We're looking at both internal connectivity and also how do we connect to other areas of Longmont and how do we connect to the larger region? Um, and what, you know, what makes most sense from for a variety of different modes? Um, in terms of development, as I mentioned, there's a lot of interest in various portions of this area. We want to make sure that this development is well connected to the existing portions of Longmont, both in the traditional sense, but also in terms of the type of development that we're seeing. Um, from a community perspective, we want to think about uh, building on the work that some of you may have participated in with the STEAM visioning that Council led in 2019 to really think about how we incentivize and encourage um, cultural arts facilities and innovation and creativity. I do want to be clear, you know, we're not talking about replacing downtown, we're not talking about replacing the museum, the makerspace that we have, but how can we build on that? You know, Longmont's got such um, an incredible community of artists and innovators and makers, and what can this space add to that? So we're interested in learning more about that. And then finally, sort of an overarching goal around sustainability, um, making sure that we're looking at long-term sustainability and resilience um, with regard to sustainability, development, building practices, low impact development, green infrastructure. So those things are all kind of the high level goals that are guiding us through this project. I'm gonna go through a few maps. Um, I don't expect you to you know, be able to see all the detail on this because I know there is a lot of detail, but just to highlight a few things. As I mentioned, we started this project in um, late 2021. And so a lot of what we did through the holidays, because frankly, it's not a great time to be out and about in the community and working with stakeholders, is we were collecting existing information. And so the series of maps that I'm about to show you are just that, showing kind of what the existing um, world looks like as it relates to transportation. And, you know, Tyler, Phil, and I, um, Ben, we'll all be reviewing these more closely. If you see anything that sticks out, certainly let us know. But what you see here is the street network. Obviously, we have a variety of different um, roadway classifications, um, all the way from arterials and collectors down to local roads. I think what's important to note here is the steam area, which generally is the western portion of the study area, kind of from Martin um, to Main Street West has a lot more connectivity and porosity in terms of the streets that exist. As you move further east, connectivity is a little bit more limited. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you you know, that's something we'll really need to look at. Um, traffic volumes, probably not a surprise to this group. Main Street carries quite a bit of volume. Ken Pratt, um, 3rd Avenue. And then obviously, as you move further east, we're carrying quite a bit of volume. And so um, thinking about opportunities for new roadway connections and what that might do for traffic volumes, also thinking about the work that um, Tyler and his group do in terms of planning for signalization, what makes sense in the future, um, we're taking all of this information in. As we think a little bit more about pedestrian access, again, I think similarly, um, the western side of the study area probably has better facilities and access currently, um, a little bit more um, isolated, so to speak, in portions of the eastern study area. Um, but that's something that this plan can definitely address. Bike infrastructure is essentially sort of the same story, right? We've got a pretty robust um, network and more plans in the work on the Western side. We really need to focus and think about how we connect to the neighborhoods to the north of the sugar mill, also to Mill Village to the Southeast, um, and obviously the, the Greenway Trail system that we just talked about um, during your last item. And so we'll be taking a look at all of those opportunities as we move forward. Um, the western portion of the study area is served by a variety of transit routes. The eastern area, not so much, sort of a theme that you're probably seeing here. Um, but we do have a variety of local routes that are adjacent to the STEAM area um, and some regional routes as well. 
Um, also opportunities with the future um, BRT and the future Kaufman Street corridor, which I'm sure um, you all are well aware of. So we're kind of taking a look at what opportunities that presents for the steam area. Obviously, this is adjacent to the future uh, first and main facility, which creates incredible opportunities. Um, both from a transportation perspective, but also from a placemaking perspective. And so that's something we'll be looking at closely. And then finally, um, railroads present an interesting um, challenge and opportunity. You can see here that there are several rail lines um, in, in and adjacent to the study area. And so we'll be working with um, property owners and transportation folks within the city to think about um, what opportunities exist for potential realignments? Obviously, there's already been some work done. You know, Emory um, and first, you know, that was a major project. I think that Tyler, I'm sure, has shared with you, and that's that's recently completed. So mm -hmm. we'll see. You know, more improvements um, in terms of rail crossings, but as we think about potential connectivity options in and adjacent to the study area, we really need to think about railroads and what our options are. So that's something that, that the project team will be um, looking at in great detail. Also worth mentioning, um, while it's not specifically related to transportation, um, there are a number of development projects and interest in development that are um, not even formal projects yet. And so that's why it's so important that we do this sub area plan right now, because what we're finding is a lot of folks are coming to the city with development ideas and asking, you know, what's the city's vision? And we certainly have some of that high level guidance in our comprehensive and multimodal transportation plan. But we don't have detail on that. And so we want to be able to provide detail on what does the community think is the most appropriate adaptive reuse for the sugar mill, historic sugar mill buildings? What does the community think um, is going to be most effective as we think about that steam area and its adjacency to Dickens Farm Nature Area and the transit station? And so I just show this to let you kind of take all in um, the projects that are currently under review and projects that we've had pre-application meetings for, which is essentially the very first stage in our development process. So lots of opportunities within this um, sub area, and I'm not gonna go through all these in detail, but um, suffice it to say, we're not starting from scratch. There's been a lot of planning work done in this area. Um, City Council, as I mentioned, did some visioning in 2019. Um, they had three meetings with an advisory panel. We had an Urban Land Institute technical advisory panel come and give some really robust recommendations on the sugar mill um, adaptive reuse. We recently completed a Main Street corridor plan, which I know we presented to this group um, back in 2018, 2019. First in Maine has been undergoing extensive planning since really 2012. Um, this is also a gateway to Longmont from the east and a gateway to downtown from the south. Um, and so there's some opportunities for placemaking there. I've already mentioned housing. We think this is a real opportunity for looking at some of those missing middle housing types um, that might be, you know, sort of between really high dense housing and single family detached. We think there's a market for that here and we'll I'll show you that here in just a second with the market study we had done. Obviously, some incredible opportunities to integrate with the existing open space system that's already been established along the river and connect to the trail system that's part of the St. Rain Greenway. Excuse me for just a second. From a transportation perspective, we'll be taking a look at um, best practices. There's some really great um, examples throughout our region and the nation of complete streets and how we might apply those to some of the streets within and adjacent to the study area. We'll also be looking at opportunities for green infrastructure and low impact development. And then again, building on the existing assets that are within and adjacent to the study area. Several challenges that we need to be aware of, and I've already alluded to, to some of these, so I won't belabor this, but I mentioned we need to evaluate um, existing signalization and then what the plan is for the future and think about how we're going to handle um, traffic on these streets. Um, there's a lack of connectivity in and around the sugar mill, and so what does that look like? You may be familiar with the extension that we uh, currently show on our comprehensive plan of Pace Street, but I think um, you know, over the years, we've realized that that may not be the most practical way to provide connectivity to this site. And so we'll be looking at other options for connecting the sugar mill area to the north um, in particular. 
I've mentioned some of the challenges with the railroad crossings. Um, there's some questions being considered on what does a, a realignment mean? Is that the same as a relocation? And, and what would that take to work with the railroads? Um, we have this great trail system that goes along the south end of the study area. We also have a railroad that um, could potentially inhibit our access. So how can we connect to the St. Rain Greenway effectively? And then obviously, um, probably not a surprise that there are some environmental conditions that are gonna need to be mitigated in and around the sugar mill site itself. And so as part of this project, we worked with our consultant to prepare a Brownfields grant, and that would help us to plan for the cleanup activities. Um, there certainly is some really interested developers in this area that are um, working on doing the correct kind of environmental assessments and sampling that are really needed. And so we're, we're moving forward with that aspect and have, have done some um, environmental assessments in the area. And then finally, you know, Josh just mentioned the floodplain issues. Um, those are real. Those need to be understood and um, figure out from a timing perspective what that means for this project. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but we, Tyler and I thought it might be interesting for you. One of the pieces of information that we included as part of our sub area plan was really to do um, to look at the market and our consultant team. Um, one of the subs on our consultant team. Did, recently did an office and industrial market study for Longmont. And so he was able to sort of confirm and update that, um, taking a look at maybe what some of the implications from COVID and the future of work, but also to add in some of the housing information. And so basically what we found from that study is that Longmont's changing. This is not a surprise to any of us. Um, we are getting older and we're growing in terms of our number of non-traditional households. So that's really the growing demand that we see going forward in terms of our growth and what that means is different housing preferences. And so, um, you know, Longmont wants to have a wide variety of housing to uh, accommodate a wide variety of residents. And we think that the study area can help with that. Um, we also know that growth is slowing. It probably doesn't feel that way to residents. Um, I know I get a lot of calls. I'm sure council member Yarbrough gets or will get calls on growth. Um, but there is a forecasted slowing of growth, both nationally and locally. And that's, you know, really a result of, again, preference, declining birth rates, people waiting longer to have children and a number of other things. There's also, um, you know, some implications for how migration, um, cost of housing and lots of different factors that are contributing to this, both in Longmont, but frankly, throughout the state. Oh, let me get back over here. Um, in terms of our economy, you know, we are recovering, um, but there's a lot of things that are frankly unknowns. And so we look at inflation, labor shortages, supply chain issues. Those are all really challenging, I think, to deal with from a, a market study perspective, because we just don't know what the timing or, um, you know, how long these impacts are going to last. Um, so the study does point to Longmont being well positioned um, in terms of our economic growth. Um, and so, you know, we obviously have quite a concentration of the right type of industries that position us well um, to capture some of the economic growth going forward. And the study area does as well. Um, so the recommendations are really, again, meeting our housing demand with a mix of housing types, both for sale and for rent, which council mentioned were really important. Um, thinking about those different missing middle housing types, thinking about how we continue to have both Big A affordable, um, consistent with our requirements, and also attainable housing um, that will help meet the needs of our growing population. Um, and then in terms of other specific types, um, not just housing, there still continues to be a lot of demand for industrial space in Longmont. Um, and that translates really to demand for e-commerce space, flex space, warehouse space, adaptive reuse, which bodes well for this study area. Um, and then we are able to capture some of this, um, even though Longmont is not necessarily inexpensive, we may be lower cost than some of our neighbors. Um, office, I think, is a real unknown still, and I think the report will show that. Um, you know, the great reset, work from anywhere, what does the future of work look like? We're still trying to figure that out, but this report shows us that Longmont has a lot of talent. 
we have space that can be transformed and we can really look to the benefits of being that small and mid-sized city. Um, some of you may have read some of those reports of the rise of the, the small city, the mid-sized city. We've got a great downtown, um, a thriving restaurant and brewery scene and people want to live here, right? And if you can work anywhere, Longmont might be a place you want to you want to relocate to. Um, and then finally with retail, um, retail has been something that has been unknown even before COVID, but I think that just exacerbated the change. So we need to look at maybe some different opportunities than we'd um, traditionally think of, such as micro fulfillment centers. Um, our TAP report that I mentioned we conducted in 2020 looked at um, maybe focusing on the sugar mill as kind of an agri hub and how can we really embrace the history of food production and sustainability to create something really cool there. Um, obviously food and beverage exactly. continues to um, be a, a big piece of our retail scene in Longmont. So um, flexibility and convenience are really what we're looking at in terms of kind of our future outlook. Um, and then I'll sort of close with community and stakeholder outreach. You know, we really want to understand what the community needs and interests are as it relates to this sub area um, and build on development and redevelopment efforts that are underway. As I've mentioned, we're not starting from scratch. We've done a lot of outreach through the Main Street plan, the comp plan, um, the steam visioning. And so we're definitely mining all of that information. So we'll be doing a lot of confirming um, with the community. We wanna be inclusive. We wanna hear from a number of folks. And so we're really excited um, to hopefully work with Growing Up Boulder to stage a number of community meetings um, in probably February and March to really engage families and children to think about kind of what could be um, in terms of adaptive reuse in this agri hub. And so we're excited about that. Um, we have had a couple meetings with property owners and prospective developers to, to figure out what their um, ideas and visions are for the areas and we'll continue that. Um, and then obviously, you know, city council will make the ultimate recommendation um, on this plan, but we hope to have a recommendation from the transportation advisory board in the spring as well prior to going to council. Um, we have a project web page and we have a project page on Engage Longmont. Um, if you haven't been to Engage Longmont, that's where, where we will be sharing the majority of our information. So um, we've really just launched that site early, um, late last year, early this year. So we'll be putting information out there, doing some brief surveying and polling um, and engaging the community that way. Obviously, I think the, the caveat I would throw out there is like everything else, you know, little uncertainty with COVID. Um, we hope to do some in-person engagement. Um, right now, we're sort of focused on um, informing the community and getting feedback online, but hopefully we'll be able to, to meet people face-to-face um, -face and get some, some great feedback, um, including from TAB. So with that, I would love to take any questions that you have, if you have ideas or thoughts that you'd like to see incorporated. Um, I would love to entertain those too. Thank you, Aaron. That was wonderful. Are there any questions of Aaron about this presentation? It looks like Liz maybe has her hand up. Okay, Liz. Thank you. And Aaron, that was a really, really um, informative presentation. Thank you for putting that together for us. My observation is because I find myself driving to the UPS center all the time. I observe that the East side auto junkyard is not included in the city boundaries and it's not part of any of this development. It looks like through all of this beautification, we're going to have that sitting there. Will it be either an aesthetic or even a hazmat issue to leave it sitting there like that? It's kind of unpleasant, but not picking on anybody's business, but it's just there. Yeah, you know, that's a really good observation. So I would say a couple things in response to your question. First and foremost, there are several properties within the study area that are not yet within the city. So this whole area, including the property you just mentioned, is within our planning area. But there's a number of properties that have not yet been annexed to the city. Some of those have some pretty significant um, cleanup issues, so to speak. Um, in terms of that specific property, you know, it was a real challenge to sort of figure out where this study area should stop. Um, and so we, we really looked towards the previous studies that had been done because that's where we had some existing data. We had some community input um, and 
and that was a property that I really struggled with. So while this won't likely provide specific recommendations on properties outside the study area, I think that property is a great example of we're seeing a little bit of interest, but we know again that there's probably some some cleanup issues that will need to occur before redevelopment can can happen. Um, and so we'll just probably work we as planning staff, you know, we as the community. It's not like we're going to turn our backs and say, well, that wasn't in the sub area. We can't, you know, we can't figure out a solution for that. Um, so I think oftentimes what happens is when you have, um, you know, a detailed plan, it sometimes acts as a catalyst for other things. And so that's sort of what I would anticipate with some of the properties that are right adjacent to this. Um, because I had a tendency to try to creep and my study area kept getting bigger and bigger and it was like, okay, rein yourself back in, you know, we've got to have something manageable. And so, yeah, you're right there. That's probably one that we need to continue to think about. Thank you. Anyone else? I've got a question. Um, and for, first a comment. Um, Fantastic presentation, very comprehensive. Um, the complete street idea for Third Avenue, um, is, is there much ability to make the type of changes to Third Avenue to really make it, I'll, I'll say, pedestrian, bike, you know, multi-use friendly versus almost like annexing, you know, Rogers Road or something that's within the boundaries there that would almost be a, a maybe a bypass? I'm just curious because I've driven Third Avenue and it's obviously not the best <laughs> street. And I think it would be a challenge, uh, especially on a bike or as a pet or, or in, you know, another form of mo uh, mobility. <clears throat> yeah, you know, Steve, that's a really good question. And I'm glad that you brought it up because I think that's absolutely something we'd want to talk about with TAB. And I know Tyler, Tyler and I and Phil, if he were here, although I'm sure he's happy he's in Hawaii instead of here with us. Um, we've talked about Third Avenue a lot. And I think for those of us who have been in the community for a while before, you know, the Ken Pratt extension was in, Third Avenue has always been um, kind of viewed as, as what it is, right? An arterial roadway. And I think, you know, I would, would ask Tyler to weigh in here too. Um, you know, it still will carry significant traffic volumes. But the consultants brought that up as an opportunity, you know, as we think about um, creating more connections to the north, as we think about how do we weave this area together with the rest of Longmont, is there an opportunity to take some of that right of way and potentially have, you know, more intersections, more porosity, um, more traffic calming? And I know that that might not be exactly what Tyler wants me to say right now, and he can weigh in. Um, but I think it's something we ought to explore. You know, does that become more of a, a truly multimodal boulevard? I mean, we've we've sort of started that with the the side paths that are on the north side and on portions of the south side. What else could could we envision there? So I think it's something we should explore. Is it something that's viable based on you know the volumes that it needs to carry and the function of the roadway? I think we need to explore that. And I don't know, Tyler, what you want to add. I think you hit the highlights there, and I think the only, I guess, one short term kind of small project we're looking at, we are doing a chip seal, of a portion of 3rd Avenue this upcoming year. And we're looking at if there's any opportunities with that chip seal to change up the striping to try and add some of that as maybe a short term interim improvement to get us towards what the ultimate is. And I think the outcomes of this study that the sugar mill once we have a better understanding of, once the report is, the study is done and packaged up, we'll have a better idea for what types of volumes we are looking at there and might be able to make some better decisions based on that information at that time. And I guess the other last thing I would ask on 3rd Avenue as a potential BRT type of almost sub route to be a feeder to go into downtown and almost be more of a, a corridor for public transportation as opposed to cars and I know that's a constraint based on traffic, but um, I just don't see it as a complete street with either traffic calming or sharrows or anything like that versus it being almost more useful as a means to kind of, you know, move the most amount of people in the quickest amount of time. That's just my two cents on that. That's helpful. Thank you. 
Any other questions for Aaron? Okay. Thank you, Aaron. That was wonderful. Very important. Thank you very much for your time. And I appreciated all the little blue places where we could go further and find out projects. There were some really great things. That, that cheese factory in Oregon, that was fun. Very fun. Thank you. All right. Okay, now it's time for comments from board members. Um, Joe, are you on the line? Oh, there you are, Joe. Do you have any comments okay. this evening? Yes. No, no, great content. All pieces that were of interest. So I don't have any particular comments. Well done by the team and staff. Thank you. How about Steve Lano? Oops, there we go. Uh, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I would just echo what Joe just said. I, th I think the reports have been uh, very good tonight. Uh, a lot of information and, uh, you know, button up job by everybody. Thank you. Liz? Um, I echo the thanks to the staff and to everyone and to the people that called in for the important information tonight. Um, it occurred to me after we finished talking about it that the safety of that 3rd Avenue intersection there at 3rd and Sherman is going to be really important when we um, are rebuilding the Boston Avenue bridge. Because I remember before there was the Boston Avenue going through there on 3rd and everybody went from 3rd to get from Maine to Hover. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be even more important that traffic calming and the parking is going to be really critical while we're rebuilding that bridge south of it. So I just wanted to mention that's something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. David. I appreciate uh, all of the very useful information that we received. I have one question. In the, in the context of the site that we were looking at, what does the acronym STEAM refer to? I'm sorry, I should have, I should have mentioned that. Um, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a flip on STEM. So it's, uh, science, technology, engineering, and in this case, arts and maker space. Yeah. Okay. So maker replaces mathematics. I mean, I think you could do math and maker if you wanted to do steam uh, squared. Right. Yes. Is there an educational component? There's absolutely an educational component, David. And if you look at some of the visioning um, that council led in 2019, and I'm happy to connect you with that. Really, some of the impetus of that was how could we get um, institutes of higher ed to really be interested in this area? We've long worked with Front Range, who's, you know, an, an awesome member of our community. But what other opportunities might there be to bring education together as part of the center of innovation and creativity? And so. Education is absolutely a piece of this. What uh, that looks like post COVID, I think, is anyone's guess, um, but we're still exploring those options. Thank you, Aaron. Diane, any comments? Well, I have a question now that we're talking about STEAM. In what ways do you think that STEAM doesn't um, easily connect with the the um, sugar mill area. What what about the steam project is so different from from the sugar mill area? Is a question that I have. Um, I don't know if Erin's still on. She is. Yeah. Hi. I, I guess I should have asked you if you wanted to be referred to as council members or uh, board members or by your first name. So I will just answer the question since I didn't ask that. Um, you know, it's not something that we honestly clued in on too much. Um, we do recognize that there's some different challenges and opportunities in a number of ways, but that was really something that council brought up at their discussion when we met with them uh, back on December 14th. I think there was some strong feelings by some members on council um, that we really shouldn't be combining these um, for whatever reason. And, and I think there's, um, you know, there are some reasons that we might combine them. There's some other reasons why we might look at them separately. And so I think what I took away from that discussion was that the sub area plan should really be deliberate about how we look at things that make sense to look at together, like transportation 
and how we really separate those things that maybe um, are different. So proximity to downtown and Main Street might have different types of character from your built environment, right? So um, I think the concern was mostly brought up by council and we just wanted to talk through that a little. And I just wanna make sure as I move forward that I'm representing that perspective because it was, it was brought up by several council members. Okay, thank you. This has been very informative and I I'm, uh, acknowledge how knowledgeable all of you are about transportation in our town. Um, um, thank you, Shakita, for um, seeing that I got appointed to this board and um, recommending me for it. And uh, I look forward to working with you more. So thank you. And I just want to thank um, council. Um, for being here and for Tyler and, and um, Ben and everyone's work on pre making presentations and answering our questions tonight, for Josh and Aaron both being here. Um, you've done really good work and um, it's exciting to see the changes that are being projected out into the future, but we can be a part of that and uh, good change for Longmont. So thank you. Um, and now I'm going to ask uh, Council Member Yarborough, do you have any comments for us this evening? Um, the presentations have been so great and so informative. So I'm just absorbing it all. And I appreciate all of your kind welcome um, to me. And so this is, this is great. I'm excited for the future. Thank you. Okay. Are there any, uh, Updates on transportation meetings, um, Tyler, that you want to mention since you sent out the, the meeting notes? Haven't um, haven't had any come up since, but okay. if anything comes up between now and the next meeting, I'll send information on how to participate to the board. Okay. Our next board meeting is February the 22nd, um, Valentine's Day, and you have down here that Dr. Cog, Denver Regional Council of Governments will be talking about their transportation improvement program. It would likely be staff discussion on tip, tip projects that we would be looking for uh, potential funding sources for. Okay. In terms of the, the Dr. Cog, their, their annual grant funding cycle. Okay. And All right. The, do we know if there's anybody else on the line uh, on the phone to talk to us? See a call in user two on here still, and I don't know if that's the same that spoke before, but um, you're still on. You can unmute yourself and, and tell us your name and your address. Well, it, if, th if they're on by phone, um, do they perhaps need someone else to unmute them? I don't know. Do you know Tyler? Um. They shouldn't be able to unmute themselves. Stacy, is there a way that you can unmute call in user two? I made attempt to unmute and it's not allowing me to do so. So they would have to do it on their end. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to say if there's not any other business, we're just going to go ahead and adjourn. Is everybody okay. one, I yes. have one question. Yes. Did I understand you to say that um, the next meeting is February 14th? Yes. Thank you. To spend our heart night together. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you uh, next month. Very good. Good night. Thank you. Good night. All right. We're adjourned. Right, thank you.